Hey y'all, thanks for being here, welcome. Um, we'll get started now as folks join in the room, they'll hop into the conversation where we're at. I'm really grateful to see each of your faces and your names um, and have you in the space, so excited to be here. Um, and welcome for joining this dance forum, Artist Survivorship, Dispelling, Reimagining, and Synchronizing. Um, my name's Audrey and Miriam, if you want to wave, say hey. We'll also be kind of leading this discussion space. Um, and this is a Collective Sweat Detroit event, which you probably already know. And it's our third birthday party this weekend. Um, we hosted our very first class in 2018, January 10 at Lightbox. And now we're here online, a um, little bit different format than in-person celebrations, but we're stoked to have you all here. Um, and if you haven't engaged with our work before, Collective Sweat is an organization that provides dance classes, artist residencies, and identity spaces, among other programming in the Detroit dance community. And our community of participants often reaches the broader Southeast Michigan dance community. And we launched our dance forum program in 2020, August, um, created in response to the shelter in place. We wanted to make a space for conversation for folks to come together, talk, and really just be in communion and continue to make fellowship with each other because we felt that we weren't having those conversations after class or catching a drink after the show or meeting up on the way to rehearsal. And we wanted to find ways that we can still have these conversations build our community even when we're not doing it in the same way. And then, yeah, it feels like a really timely conversation. We also acknowledge like the past week's flagrant display, displays of white supremacy in action in our capital. And I feel like I don't have to explain that like we already knew it was there. We just, this was one week where we saw it again. And so we're holding that it's a complicated time to hold conversation space that is not in direct relationship to what has happened this past week. And I think that this also could be a space for gener generated discussion, how we come together, create support, create community. I think it's related. So I hope this can be a generative space for all of us. And I'm gonna pass it over to Miriam, who's gonna take us through a little bit more of our housekeeping and we'll go from there. Yeah, so, um... First, I just want to acknowledge the other organizers, the CSD organizers in the room, Maddie and Teresa and Bree, of course, Audrey and myself, hello. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we're not going to like take a whole lot of time to introduce ourselves, but we just wanted to wave and say hello. And then as we have a discussion, you'll learn about us or you'll, maybe you already know. Um, so a couple of notes. One, if there's anything that comes up in this time where something, I don't know, you might need help or you wanted to make sure that you um, said something, just shoot a message in the chat. And if it's like more technical, shoot Brie a message um, and she'll be able to help you out with any technical issues you may run into because Zoom is not guaranteed. <laughs> you know, things are strange. Um, if you don't already have your name and pronouns in um, the little name place. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that. In the area where your name is, please do so. I need to add mine also, but um, just so that we know how to refer to you and we don't um, acknowledge you inappropriately. And then also we have closed captioning available. So if you need at the bottom of your screen, maybe, I'm looking at my screen and I'm trying to figure out where it is. Um, well, I know that it exists. I should say, your, uh, your frame might be small, Miriam. If you go oh, into more, it says closed captioning in there. Heard. It is because I have a whole bunch of things on here for me to see. Thank you for that. Anyway, um, at the bottom, you can turn it on if you need. Um, sometimes it just helps me to read along as I'm listening. So, And then really quickly for space agreements. I'm not going to go into super detail, but um, we do want to agree to be in this share in this kind of a shared space together and acknowledging, especially with this kind of a conversation, um, that we're all entering it the same way. So um, we'll post them in depth in the chat if you want to read them further. But they also came with the registration, so you might have already. But um, 
but we're just going to agree to enter this space fully present, um, fully present with ourselves, fully present with each other, fully present with our bodies um, and what we may or may not need. As Audrey said earlier, like feel free to grab a drink, use the bathroom, whatever you need to do like to honor your body in this time, please do so. Um, but we're also going to share this space with respect towards each other, again, towards ourselves, speaking from our own experiences, using the I, um, and by honoring each other's privacy and whatever we decide to share. If you decide to share something, um, well, let me back up. One, we're recording this to later than be posted on YouTube and our website. So if you decide to share something and you're like, oh, I wanted to say that in the conversation, but not to be recorded, shoot us a message, shoot free a message. You can email us afterwards. Um, Cause I know I'm one to be like, oh, actually I'm overthinking that one section now and I want you to take it out. <laughs> so if you're like me, you can shoot us a message afterwards. Um, and we'll, no problem, no, we'll take it out. And then, you know, Zoom rules. So staying on mute, until we are ready to speak or until you've been called on to speak. And um, and yeah, that's all we have for space agreements. I didn't wanna like give them into detail cause I don't know, to me it could feel a little bit like a lot, a lot of information. But, um, but yeah, we do wanna make sure that we acknowledge that. Cool. I'm gonna pass it back to Audrey for a group check-in to get us fully physically and mentally ready. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for speaking those agreements into the space. Um, and yeah, let's kind of check in and ground in as a group. I want to offer a moment to get into our bodies and then we'll go around say names and maybe a couple words as to sort of where we're coming from into the space. So before we begin speaking, let's just take some time to kind of come into our bodies, feel where we're at, um, and gather what we need. So you can keep your camera on or if you wanna really be in your own sense of world, you can turn your camera off for this moment. It's really up to y'all. But just wherever you are, you can stay seated. You can choose to stand. You can close your eyes, keep them open. Just bring your attention fully to every piece of your body that is touching the chair or the ground or the floor. Any piece of your body that's sort of closest to the earth, whether that's the base of the feet, back of the thighs, sits bones, perhaps the back. Also noticing maybe where the palms of the hands or the forearms might rest on the body. And connecting to the weight of these places, feeling the weight of the earth in support of your body. Notice Anything that comes from this place, notice the density, the texture of your body in connection to the earth, your body listening to the earth. And then starting from these places of connection with the earth, bring your attention up. So you could almost think of it as you're sort of traveling up through your body mentally, imagining moving through the calves, bringing your attention through the layers of muscle in the thigh, bringing your attention through the belly, the intestines, guts, ribs, lungs, heart space, through the neck, through the arms, through the head. And let yourself kind of take note, notice what you notice. And bring your awareness to all of these places where you let your attention wander and travel. And from this place of noticing, bring your attention fully to your breath. Allow your breath to perhaps deepen, allow your breath to widen, allow your breath to fully inhabit your body. So as the lungs pull air in, to sustain your life, allow that air to fill the whole container of your body, all that you noticed. And then with each exhale, letting your breath 
exit fully from the body. So this exchange of breathing, this work of breathing, this both effort and ease of breathing is happening from and to the whole body, happening within and in support of the whole body. And start to bring your attention to your head, place where your senses, where many of your senses kind of lie. Notice what you hear. Notice how you might smell. Notice any taste in your mouth or the texture of tongue. And then maybe you can choose to open the eyes or keep them closed and notice what might be there. And then call in whatever else that I may not have named that you'd like to call in for yourself into your body, into your awareness. And then we'll kind of come back to the screen, come back to the digital space, still in our bodies, still with all that we need with us available always available to tap into our senses. All right. And as we're starting to come back, see what you notice, maybe choosing to notice the screen or not. And then before we transition into discussion, I, we want to offer a chance for everyone to speak their names into the space and kind of share a little bit about where you're coming from. So the prompt for this check-in will be mood movement mantra, three M's. So you'll share your name, share your pronouns if you like, and then maybe one or two, let's say max two words on what your mood is right now, like what general mood vibe etc. Mantra. What is your mantra for yourself right now? That can be interpreted in many ways. Something you've been telling yourself, a new revelation that you might want to share, maybe something that just comes off the top of the head. That Any of that can be interpreted as mantra. And then movement is what is your movement for today? And then I want to offer, it's sort of like that silly telephone exercise, but I think it's fun. So we're going to do it. Um, I want to offer, if you would like to embody each person's movement after they do it. So it would be like, okay, I'm Audrey, go, 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 go. My movement today is this. And then I would invite everyone to embody it and try it. So we can sort of feel each other a little bit. Sound cool? All right. Um, and I think we'll, let's put our names in the chat to like sign up to speak. So if you don't want to check in, don't put your name in the chat, but I'd love to hear from y'all. Um, and I'm happy to start us off and then we can kind of fill up the chat to get in line, so to speak. All right, so I'm Audrey, she, her pronouns. Oh, and let's also share kind of where we're zooming in from. I'm zooming in from Oakland, California on Ohlone land. And my mood today is like kind of chill. I'm grateful for that. My mantra lately has been just make a decision and then do the decision. And then my movement, today is probably just like, this, like a slow something. Cool. All right, let me peek at this chat. Okay, I think Maddie is next, go for it. Hi, I'm Maddie. Um, my mood is like good and quiet. I'm in a good and quiet mood. Uh, my mantra today is to like, just like have a nice time. <laughs> That's my mantra for today. I've been like very stressed for the past like four days or something. So I'm like ready to not feel that way. So I'm not gonna. Um, and this is my movement. Oh, 
Oh, I'm zooming in from, did I say where I was at? I'm in my apartment in Dearborn. Sweet, thanks, Maddie. Passing it to Tree next. Hi, I'm Tree, she, her pronouns. I am Zooming from Ferndale, Michigan today in my home. And today I'm actually feeling a little scattered, but also very motivated. So I don't know how those two go together, but somehow they are for me in this moment. Um, my mantra lately has just been um, like put on pants, like put, like put on clothes, you know, and like actually do your day, even though you're not going anywhere. So my mantra has been put on pants. I like think that every morning. Um, and um, I don't, my movement, I don't know, it's just like a warm hug. Check. Cool, passing it to Bree. Hey y'all, Bree. I'm calling in all the way from Karlsfeld, Germany, which is by Munich. Um, let's see, my mood is, it's a little bit tired, but I'm okay, because it's a little bit later here. Um, my mom, fresh start slash reprogram. So trying to just new steps, see where they're gonna go. And then my movement is just uh, a really good head roll. Nice. Okay, I think Monica is next. Go for it. Hey, I'm Monica, she, her, and I'm in my house on the east side of Detroit. Um, my mood for today is I'm calm. Um, there's just been a lot going on where I haven't been so sure of like what's going on with my future, but I'm calm now because I have answers. And that goes along with my mantra to like not not plan too much, plan just enough. <laughs> um, and my movement today uh, would kind of be similar to Audrey's, just a big mm, face swipe. Thanks, Monica. Okay, Christina, go for it. Hi, I'm Christina, she, her. I am in Chicago, Illinois. Um, my mood today is um, pretty content. Um, I had a good productive like start to the day. So I just, that feels nice. Um, and I think my mantra is try new things. Um, and my movement, oh my gosh, like no movements are coming to me. I think my movement is just arms up. <laughs> yeah. All right, Miriam, you next. It's me. Um... Miriam, she, her. I am on the west side of Detroit <laughs> where I'm zooming in. I have like a little bit of nervous energy. I always feel like these, like these conversations feel full, but sometimes like larger conversations with groups, I'm like, oh, stressed. Um, so, but if I name it, I just have to name it. Um, I feel, oh, my mantra, I think my mantra is just stillness, just the word stillness. And my movement is just like a push down. Okay. Sweet, I think Kathy's next. Hi, um, Kathy, she, her. Um, my mood is no sleep. Um, I didn't sleep uh, last night and the night before. So right now my mantra is kind of keep going. Um, 
because I've got a busy weekend. Um, and my movement is, is this. That's kind of what my body needs right now. All right, Katie, go for it. Oh, hi, uh, everyone. I'm Katie. Uh, it's really good to be here with everyone. Um, right now, I'm feeling like I'm really excited to be here, but I'm also a little bit anxious, like uh, Miriam, and like just having some like anxiety, like in my heart center. I feel. Um, so I think right now my my like mood is like to like for self forgiveness. And like just stepping into some like humor and like silliness, but also like just kind of finding a balance. I think as a Libra, I'm always like searching for like that balance of like how to, um, you know, hold different emotions for myself and for like the people around me and stuff. So um, yeah, I think my, so my movement is like this, <laughs> like, Mm, mm, mm. something like that. All right, check. Sweet, thanks. And then Carlos to finish us off for check-in. Uh, hello, I don't know if everybody can hear me. We can hear you, yeah. I uh, apologize, I'm trying to get my camera figured, figured out here. No worries, no worries. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for everybody for, uh, um, thank you for inviting me, Audrey. I uh, appreciate uh, being able to come in and check in with everybody in uh, these interesting times. Um, I think my mood is, um, I don't know, I stay in a constant state of like being driven, whether that's just kind of how I am and, and kind of programmed. Um, I think my mantra is define your target and direction appears. Um, cause that's just how I've been rolling, <laughs> you know, it's never feeling like I ever have a, have a sense of being able to, you know, stop and take, take things in, which I am trying to work on. I think, um, that's very valuable to actually pause and absorb everything that's around you. Um, and until I can get my camera, maybe let's just all take another deep breath in really from our heart chakra space and as much as we can push our chest out. Deep breath in and slowly let it out to what your body needs. Mm. Thank you for that breath, Carlos. And thanks everyone for checking in. Good movements, not good. I'm not trying to say words of value. Helpful movements, generative movements. Um, I wanna pass it over to Miriam to kind of get us started on our discussion. Yeah, that final breath felt really good. I just have to acknowledge that I needed that yes. one. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Carlos, for that. Um, okay. I'm just gonna like look back and forth between my notes. So if you see me doing this, just know that's what's going on. Um, we wanted to start this conversation kind of, and I, we've mentioned this a little bit so far, but we wanted to start by just acknowledging this time that we're in and even the things that happened this week um, and just the way that that held, um, is held in our bodies, the way that that puts weight in our bodies. Um, and just really saying out loud that this shit is hard and wanting to acknowledge it so that we can really work through it and talk through it properly. Um, we are talking about, Audrey and I were talking about this yesterday and we just felt like we couldn't jump into this conversation without saying that first, because mm -hmm. um, it just wouldn't be in the right context. Um, and so when we started thinking about artist survivorship, it was like, I don't know, it was a meeting from a few weeks back. And I think at least the way that I was thinking about it was like, what is this, <laughs> this time that we're sitting in right now, artists are kind of in a weird space of their work, like 
our work doesn't look the same way um, for kind of an indefinite amount of time. Um, and so what does that mean for our practices? What does that mean for our ability to like, I don't know, what does that mean for our ability to sustain with this practice? What does that mean financially for artists? Um, the way that our field has kind of been upended. And, um, and so I really started questioning like, okay, well, what does that, like, what does that look like on the end of this? So whenever we get to the end, whatever that means, am I still an artist if my practice doesn't look the same? Am I still an artist if I um, have to leave my practice so that I can financially sustain in a different way? Like, am I still an artist if I don't practice at all? Like, I, I started wondering these things and bringing them up in our meetings. Like, hey, I don't, these are some of the questions that I'm simmering with. Um, and don't get me wrong, I do think that you're an artist when you're not, <laughs> when you're not in like a main practice. But I just was wondering on a mass scale, when artists aren't practicing, when dancers don't have access to studio spaces, and so then their practices change, or at least the studio dancers' practices change. Um, and we're not in contact with each other physically. What does that mean for I, our survivalhood, what does that mean for our ability to survive as an artist on the end of this? Um, and that's kind of uh, the context for us thinking about artist survivorship. Um, Audrey, I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Thanks for that, like such a succinct and solid intro. Um, I also want to add, I think these questions of how are we surviving, how are we sustaining, um, yeah, I'm seeing Carl's put in the chat, reframe, reconfigure, re-engage, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm also thinking of how does that lead us into actually discussing what does our adaptation look like right now, yeah. and how are we in conversation with each other as we are adapting, how are we sensing and listening to each other? How are we responding to each other? How are we supporting each other in our adaptation, whether that's adapting our practices, maybe that it's that our practices are, are the same and they are sustaining our like self survivalhood. And what can we learn from that? What can we learn from practices that don't rely on the studio, don't rely on the stage to sustain themselves? Um, so I think adaptation is another lens. And then I'm really wanting to talk about this idea of synchronicity with all that. How are we building um, support for each other? How are we synchronizing in our adaptation? And then another, I think maybe last piece before we jump into discussion that might be useful to give context for is like, um, I feel like there's also just so many expectations that we are all working through and that's an assumption that I'm making to say that we're all working through expectations, but maybe we are, maybe we aren't, but expectations around like what our practices look like when it's not the same. How do how does my sense of my own identity have to shed expectations that have been mm. kind of seeped in that relates my identity as a dancer or my practice looks a certain way? So entry questions, entry ponderings, um, yeah. So um, that's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> this is like that's where our question. brain was. <laughs> that's a is, question. <laughs> and like, I, Audrey and I have had a lot of dense conversations about this. So we're kind of like at the ready. Um, mm -hmm. But we want to first like start with the offering or the question of what are we doing right now to take care of ourselves, to survive, to support each other? Um, to support ourselves, whether that's dance related or not, but like, what are the things that you're doing that are sustaining you? Yeah. And and we can um, bop around if we want. And so you can sign up in the chat the same way that we did for the, um, words are escaping me, the intro for lack of better words. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So and Monica, it looks like you're ready to go. So I'll call on Monica and then you can sign up from there. Hey. So I've had um, some big feelings about this and a lot of conversation around it as well. Um, just, I think I feel a lot of pressure to generate new work, just being in an MFA program where they expect me to be presenting things often. And I'm in a program with, it's a multidisciplinary program. So writers and sculptors. And so they have studios often in their home that they're working out of um, or places that they're working alone, which not to say that dancers can't work alone or have solo work, but my work was very like group oriented. So I felt like I was being forced into this new way of practice. Um, but in, in, in order to keep myself sane, I felt like I had to support everything that was online. So I thought that I was supporting other people by constantly taking these online classes and just going to anything that I was available to go to um, when it was making me, it was just draining me. Um, and so I feel guilty not supporting online artists because, or people who are presenting things online because I would want someone to support me. I'm trying to create more online content just to stay relevant, whatever that means. Um, but I feel like it's also hard to get people to come to online or pay money to, to do online events. So I'm, I, in my mind, that's what would be supportive and taking care of each other is attending events like this or buying downloadable links for online virtual performances. But then I also just feel exhausted at trying to fit it all into my schedule and letting people down. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing that. I know that I, I feel really similarly um, drained by trying to attend everyone's events and, and simultaneously like feeling like I should or I have to to be supportive. So thank you for that. Uh, Kathy. Hi. Um, yeah, I've been trying to do the online content thing uh, too. Um, so what I've been doing is I've been creating a contemporary class that is now going to be on YouTube on Thursdays. Um, and I like that it keeps me moving and it keeps me in touch with dance. Um, but what it also does is now I'm doing what I do for a living and not getting paid for it, which kind of, you know, in my soul feels weird. And, and I don't like um, encouraging that artists should be giving their things away for free because then there'll be more of that and that doesn't pay the bills for anybody. Um, um, I am still working for Living Arts, teaching classes for kids, which really um, feels good um, to be uh, supporting the community and seeing some people online. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. And I guess I want to say too, as far as like the monetary thing for online, I don't think I'm going to be in a place where I could charge for my content to have like that kind of a following for a really long time, you know? Um, so I guess that's my feelings. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Tree, do you wanna go for it? Thanks. Yeah, it just popped into my head. Um, Kathy mentioned how she's still teaching for living arts. And I think that's how I've been taking care of myself is I have students who rely on me as well because um, I teach at a university. And so it's my job to keep motivating these kids so that they can get their degrees and do whatever is next after that. And then, but I haven't been making any art or really doing any art on my own. And so thinking about that, like, I don't have that motivator. I don't have somebody keeping me in check. I don't have somebody keeping me in line um, the way that I am for my students. Um, 
So it's just like, I've just been letting it all trickle. Um, so I guess just in line with the question, just, yeah, I guess teaching has been keeping me alive and surviving, but yeah, I don't know how to really get back and like out of these funks and these feelings and stuff to work on my own practice. Yeah. Carlos, go for it. Um, uh, for those that may not know me, I, I do, um, I'm a dancer, choreographer, but also a filmmaker. So I think for me, um, I've always been, like you said, in a constant state of making, whether it's, you know, dance or actually providing support for other individuals via helping others generate content and helping them, uh, you know, um, in a collaborative way, um, sift through their own voice, um, or they might bring a project and they need uh, someone that, you know, can provide cinematography or filmmaking um, to help their practice. Um, Cause I've always been a champion of, uh, I've kind of always said, hey, the future is gonna be video and, and, and media content creation. That's just um, uh, a good brother of mine, um, Marcus White, we had uh, started uh, moving 24 frames per second and um, that festival. And that was, you know, five years ago because I've always was like, hey, you know, artists, uh, and it also goes back to the way that I look at being an interdisciplinary media artist and multidisciplinary artist. Uh, and that's kind of where the space we are in now. It's kind of like not necessarily being clairvoyant or Rasputinesque, but, <laughs> you know, um, and I think that one thing that we, that I, when I'm in, uh, when I'm teaching at different universities is that you know, I say, hey, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's like, we all have to kind of, and it's a very uneasy place. It's not, it doesn't feel great. You know, um, we as dancers, we're social creatures. We want to engage physically. And how does that, how do we reimagine that? So I think that one of the things that um, I've kind of been blessed with being that kind of creator is I've actually been able to work with other artists um, when we felt it safe in helping them produce some content for their, for, for their means and for their medium. Um, and, you know, um, I think Brie, you also do uh, media uh, 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 content creation as well. So um, afterwards, I, I'm, I'll, I'll say for myself, if anybody has questions about that or my particular approaches, you know, you can feel free to, you know, um, you know engage. I think it's me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to articulate this as best as possible because we were saying before, like my, like our social skills are not as good as they used to be because I'm not as talking to as many people. Um, so here we go. Um, but yeah, like Carlos was saying, I'm also a multidisciplinary artist and I do a lot of things, uh, which I think up until literally today, I realized is sometimes a distraction or like can be viewed as so many hustles or like just working all the time for everybody and everything. And during this time, I've really had to slow down. That's become a new mantra is to slow down and take care of myself and what myself and my family need. And sometimes that's just not having a movement practice. Honestly, been the longest time I've gone without having a consistent movement practice. I've had like bouts here and there, um, but I've really leaned into other spaces to take care of myself and what I need. And that's okay. Um, but definitely at the beginning, I had this sense of guilt that I think a lot of people has. Like now we have all these things at our fingertips. Like we should be doing this. We should be supporting all of our friends. We should be taking these classes, but that doesn't always feel good. And so uh, I was talking with my sister today and she also finally had the feeling of like, move when you need to move or when you want to move and lean into that space. Don't feel guilty that you haven't danced in a week. That's okay. You know, you can do other things. Like I picked up knitting socks. That's something that brings me joy now and I'm leaning into that real hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, and another mantra that's been sticking with me during this time to really take care of myself and my husband as well is do what you need to do to get through. And so if that's dancing, do it. If it's taking a break, do that. Take an extra breath. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been trying to do. 
to make it through. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I um, want to acknowledge a couple of things that popped up in the chat. And um, they're in the chat so you can read who if you want, but uh, feeling overwhelmed by the amount of online content folks are putting out and wishing that you could support more is a feeling that's coming up. And lack of physical contact and shared space with others is making it difficult to have a dance practice, um, which, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that they were spoken into the space. Um, Maddie. Hey. Yeah, I, um, the, like the question, like what it, what is helping you or yeah, like what's what's working or something was like the a version of this question. Uh, yeah, I don't feel that my like artistic practice is like really working, <laughs> which is okay because some like all of the things that are working are these like lovely things that I never did before because I like didn't have time. And like I'm a person, I took a I take a lot of comfort in like planning things out ahead of time and having like sort of like these concrete things that are going to happen. And I had like, you know, I like was doing all these part-time jobs and like childcare and I like had all this stuff going on before the shelter in place. And I was like really on my scheduling and stuff. And uh, like now it's, it's silly to try to plan things cause you just can't, but I've, um, so like what I have been doing that like makes me feel really good and like brings me a lot of joy is I have started like I can like I can really cook now like I can really do the thing I'll plan these like wonderful menus and I'll like go to the store and like get all this stuff and I'll do like this these like wonderful like night after night of like good food meals like a lot of soups and then I like freeze it all and I've like planned everything you know like every like onion like down to the you know exactly the right number and it just it just feels really good and then I have all this good food and then it's in my freezer and now I'm like baking so I'm like baking plans so this is the new thing that's like makes me feel really good it has like nothing to do with dancing that stuff is confusing and doesn't make me feel very good uh like everybody or like many people have said that like the online there's like a lot of uh I'm not excited to take online classes necessarily all the time. So I take them very rarely. Um, and so I feel like comforted that that's a thing I've heard in other people too. And it's like, yeah, like that. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's like, not just me <laughs> who's like, doesn't want to do this. So yeah, but I love making soup. So I just wanted to put soup out there for people. <laughs> I just loved reading the comments roll in during <laughs> your explanation. Everybody's just like, yeah, soup, food, let's go. Um, I love a recipe or two, you know, whenever you feel like sharing, just throw it in the chat and um, we can all cook really good food tonight. Uh, I threw my name in here and now I'm trying to remember why. So bear with me. Oh, I think I, I feel similarly to you, Maddie, in that the part of the way that I'm taking care of myself is like, this is sort of jumping forward, but thinking about what else I want to know that I now have time to learn how to do that, like, I'm by, I probably wouldn't have. And some of it was kind of surprising to me. So the first thing, and I think a lot of people did this, is I bought a lot of plans and just like started learning how to take care of plants, how to take care of these things that are in my home, um, which got really interesting. And like some of my plants have babies now as I'm looking around and it like felt really good, especially cause my, um, my grandfather was a horticulturist and like, I know that has like a long lineage in my family. So there's a moment that when I finally had time to stop that my body leaned into the things that maybe it already knows. So that felt like sustaining to me. Um, and then also just things like I haven't done in a long time, like biking. And we just had bikes sitting around and we were like, let's go biking, uh, my partner and I. And so then we started going biking all the time. And I like something about it felt freeing and like I could get out of the house and be safe without 
really having to interact with people and I can feel like I'm doing something, I can take care of my body. Um, but I, like, it wasn't there, it's not dance related. And I think that I've had like a kind of a back and forth with dance for a little while since before the pandemic, but the pandemic was like, and bring it to a halt, which um, also gave me the space to think about like, what kinds of dance do I really wanna prioritize in my life anymore? Like, what are the dances and this is also kind of jumping around, but uh, what are the dance forms that were created in home spaces that I could be learning from? And um, and that ultimately, like studio dance forms need to be learning from. So those are the things that are helping me like sort through it right now. Um, yeah, Carlos. No, uh, real quick, I, I was really, um, thank you for uh, everything you were saying was teasing up some um, things there, Miriam. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to offer to the space as she was speaking um, was that this idea of, um, um, and someone else, um, I believe it was Maddie and then also Monica, were talking about this idea of guilt in approaches to practice. And, um, you know, it's, I've had some really interesting experiences with some great mentors and um, this idea of letting go of guilt actually will give space to new learning, right? So if we kind of like let go of that, oh, I'm not doing this as I always have, it's like, okay, maybe, to, maybe this is the space we all need to reset, right? Like this is, you know, not to get into weird thinking out there, but, you know, it's kind of like, it's like reset, you know, like when you have to reset the computer and we have to actually unlearn because one of the um, challenging things is I'm teaching in different academic um, settings in different places as a guest artist when I come in is that um, the one challenge in academia that it's fomented on this idea that the academy is the only way to think or approach about dance and movement. And I was always a non-traditionalist because I actually come from more of a, um, urban dance aesthetic practice, you know, house, breaking, capoeira, martial arts, like, so I've always been on the other side of movement and I came into dance, um, into modern ballet and abstracted movement. Um, so, you know, so you can see movement in many different spaces when you were saying that you were going to, um, you know, working out, you know, that's all pedestrian, right? So like reframing, you know, this goes back to this reframing how movement and different studies, and you can have many, um, one thing I do for myself is uh, in my practice of creating film, either for myself or with collaborators, um, is that they're placeholders for future work that can maybe be on a proscenium stage, whether, or it could be performed in a um, museum setting, or that I also create it for its own life inside of the digital space. You know, so I wanted to offer that up to where, you know, and if it's new to you, that's great too, you know, because that's that's part of what the learning thing is. That's part of the learning curve and reaching out to other people that may, um, uh, may be further down the road. Um, and then also, um, yeah, yeah, and just, you know, um, I was just really excited about how you just, because that's really how I look, you know, this thing about moving and engaging in a dance aesthetic way where it's like, oh, well, there's so many different ways that you can look at pedestrian movement that also feed in some of the people, um, some of the choreographers that are very current and buzzing actually come from let's do studies off pedestrian movement and stir them up into larger practices. So I want to, you know, um, you know, it's, you know, it's like planting a seed or in a plant, you know, a plant has to be nourished from many different elements. You know, it's got to have the water, it's got to have the sun, it's got to have the minerals. And so we as artists, we're plants and, and it's okay to absorb. And sometimes we need a certain amount of sunlight from here and we need to focus on other things over here. So um, I want to just keep encouraging everybody to, you know, uh, pressing through, you know, that, that's where, that's where it's at. Yes, all of that. Um, thanks, Carlos. I think I want to pass it to Monica. And then after Monica, I think we're at a perfect space to kind of transition into our next place of 
a question. So go for it, Monica. Um, awesome. So uh, kind of jumping off both Carlos and Miriam now, um, I started doing a lot, a lot of dancing outside um, just out of necessity for space. And then I came to love it so much. Um, I ended up going to rehearse inside uh, one time and it was just like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like this practice is an outdoor practice. But then upon talking to some of my friends about having like outdoor showings or outdoor classes, I was met with a ton of hesitation and not because of like COVID stuff, but they were just like not willing to go to something that was not, they were like, oh, well, we'll just wait till we can like have a normal performance. And I was like, but what if that was my normal performance now? <laughs> what if I'm always outside? Um, so I just, and this might be, you know, we don't have to answer because we want to move on to other topics, but like, what is this hesitation of like, you, you know, breaking out into these new things? Like why, why do some of us hold on so, so dearly to this traditional place of where dance has to happen. Um, and as far as Miriam with like opening up and Maddie opening up yourself to new things in this time, I felt the total opposite. It, um, and Brie, you might, might relate to this in some way, but um, one day I just woke up to a text message from my children's school that school was closed. And all of a sudden I was homeschooling. Um, <laughs> And so a lot of my practice would happen when they were at school. And I love my friends that are teachers and I want them to stay safe. And I appreciate them as human beings because I'm not a teacher at all um, in that sense. But it was really hard <laughs> for me to have a job and an artistic practice when I was trying to homeschool children. And then uh, I just think about the impact and this is not it's artistic related to me, but the impact of households of who's going to stay home and homeschool these children is going to be women. Uh, a lot of women making the choice in these families to stay home and not be working anymore. And so just like that aspect of household um, uh, and gender roles and um, loss of passion, just because, you know, that's what's been happening. So that's been weighing heavily on my mind with like giving up. I have to make the choice of like, do I make a dance class right now for collective sweat tomorrow? Or do I finish um, cleaning the house or cleaning up after kids? So that's just been weighing on my heart lately. <laughs> yeah, thanks Monica. Um, yeah, all of that. I think I'm, I'm curious next if we could continue in this place of like, what does our practice look like now? And then like, I think there's a lot in what folks have mentioned around like guilt or expectations on not doing it in the same way. But before we do that, maybe we should take like a two minute little stretch break. So I just wanna offer either a, a two minutes to like go away from the screen and like go pee, get some water, or like do a forward fold, or you can stay here and just like continue to look at the screen, do, do your thing, but it's the 01, so let's come back at the 03. Does that sound cool? Um, I just want to speak something into the space, or we can do it when everyone comes back. Amy, just put something in the chat that I'd just mm, Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Maybe we'll yeah, do until it. people come back. <laughs> yeah, when people are yeah. all. Sweet. All right, see y'all in two.
All right, welcome back. Um, as we're kind of settling back, maybe I want to speak out what Amy added into the chat as far as our last, like where we left off in discussion. Um, and writing, as a teacher in public school, we have spent a lot of time thinking and talking about the pressures on parents around their children's education. And then um, also this, like this discussion about our art practices, thinking about our value systems pertaining to education and what is important or essential in terms of academic content, social and emotional development. And hey, Monica, miss you. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, I do, have do you, sure. Uh, I was just gonna read the question. So now we're kind of shifting gears slightly to thinking about um, the act a little, a little, a little words expectation stigmas and like sometimes even shaming um, around our practices. The like kind of narrative that you just gotta stick to it and. Um, when we were talking about this in creation of this um, forum, we were kind of talking about the way that when artists like make decisions to leave the forum or to financially sustain in another way, that there's like a little bit of like, there's just a little something in the way that um, we talk to each other and we look at each other and like, so it's kind of going back to the question of like, what qualifies like you as an artist, like, or what, how are we thinking about that? And how can we expand to be um, really mindful of the choices that people have to make in their lifetimes or choose to make in their lifetimes? Um, so yeah, a couple of points that we have here is uh, just like the idea that it would be beneficial to grow out of these that kinds of expectations, especially when you have artists on a mass scale out of their normal routine and work. Um, and how do we support artists who are making this decision to move in other capacities to um, sustain in other ways to sustain when their practice looks different. Um, how are we supportive of that? So yeah, so I guess going back to the main question, it's how do we remove the shame, stigma, and expectations around our practices? I think I can go first because uh, while we're all kind of simmering with the question, the thing that comes up for me the most is um, I look to Afrocentric techniques. I look to, I didn't grow up in them, but um, I mean, to some extent, just like, cause I'm at the function and I'm in the room, but like, I didn't have a regular practice. My dance practice was mostly rooted in ballet and modern dance. And once I got older, I started looking to other practices that were of people that look like me. And what I found is just like the way we think about value, the, the ways that those spaces um, can be, can feel accessible. Um, are things that like help me to understand like moving this removing the stigma because I think there are dancers who have for a long time created in their home spaces created on concrete for have created in whatever kind of space that they have I think that for a long time there are dancers of styles that like didn't um like that they would meet up with their crew at like 9 10 p.m <laughs> that for a long time like would fit in dance where it needed to fit and they were absolutely still a dancer and like maybe that practice happens once a week um maybe it happens like once a month but nonetheless like that practice happens 
when it needs to happen at the timing that it needs to happen wherever it can. And I look to those forms and um, many times it's like a, as an unlearning, it's been an unlearning process for me as I look at them, like what, are, how, how different the values are. Um, how many of those spaces allow for parents to bring children um, and what does it like how that opens up accessibility within that if you can wear your baby on your back and dance or your child can be on the side of the room it's not always like super I'm not saying that to say that they've like figured everything out, but I do think that the values depending on where you are in the world are different. And that's helped me to understand like where my values actually lie and help me to shift my mindset and unlearn some of the gunk that I've learned um, over the years. I don't know if that was clear, but those are the things that are in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that was super clear. Um, I want to read this chat is popping off with great things. Um, and I want to read them. Let's see. Amy writes, these questions really feel like the things I've spent time inside of for a long time due to being a single mother throughout the greater part of my education and post-education practices and choices. And then Christina writes, to be honest, I had to step away and remove things that made me feel the most guilty. Removing social media apps was crucial. Yes. But there's a separate guilt around that too. And then Monica writes, motherhood in the dance world equates to the death of the artist. There's a lot in that. There's a lot in that. How do we give value to artists as artists who do not practice with the same apparent vigor? Yeah. Um, the, this question of like vigor is maybe where I want to start. Um, for me, I've been like letting go of and like kind of moving through what feels like a really necessary transformation within like letting go of the gaze, the audience gaze that like lives in my body, whether that is the audience of like Western dance, the academy, or like the idea that I need to have this career trajectory that I'm supposed to be following on and like letting go. And when I say letting go, it's like, I'm not done letting go of it. It's a, it's a muscle, it's an active process, but like the work of letting that go has been a lot of reflecting on how, how does my relationship to my body, my time, my sense of my lifetime have to change when it's not directly attached to dance as the central thing and it's been exciting because I'm like oh I I actually may have a, a greater different calling on this earth that is not just like I need to be working on my plie like it's been interesting to even like let go of my like instant response to my own body like this is a really silly reflection but I, it feels appropriate to share I was in my room the other day and I just like did a releve because like why not do a releve in fresh position at any moment and I had this interesting noticing that like oh my like turnout muscles are not as strong as they were maybe two years ago and my instant reaction was not oh that needs to be better or oh I need to self-correct that it was just like oh this is my releve today and I was like what this is I didn't even know that I had this instant thing that whenever I did a movement there was this little part of me that was like, it has to improve, it has to work, it has to, like, what, what is it to change my relationship to my body that is not always, like, in alignment with how is it making me a better dancer? So that's been a big thing I've been having to work through and dispel, and, like, I think, I think that the, like, looking to systems that are not the Western Academy, that are not the, the like white and white supremacist dance regime, I would even call it, that is like, you have to control your body. You have to be in charge of your body so that you can perform for this one director. Um, I, think, I think we need to work through that as a community because that's like some deep shit that's in a lot of people who have gone through at least 
a college program in the United States. Not everybody has to work through that, but I know that some of my peers in this space have had similar, like, te like um, just similar teachers because we've been in the same program. So perhaps share a similar experience. So I just talked a lot. So I'm gonna stop talking and pass it on to Brie. Okay, I'm just gonna try to pop through my notes for things that have been like bubbling at the surface. Um, so what I'm feeling in responsibility, both to ourselves and each other, what's popping up is holding conversations like this and how language is so important in and out of the dance space. How we choose to speak about dance, how we choose to speak about what is professional or non-professional or recreational, or I hate this term like adult dance classes. Like, what does that even mean? We're all adults and we take dance classes? Like, sure, okay. So it's kind of like this binary of either or. So if someone chooses to step away, you're automatically not a dancer. No, that's not true, it's in your body. Like I, and it's so sad to me that it wasn't until it was in my final year of university and I was 20, what was I, 24? that I finally called myself a dancer because I was always doing other things. So I felt like I was on this binary line, even though I was in a dance university program, like this so weird, it's so messed up. And it's like, and if we choose to take on the role of like an educator, I think that's even more important when you're dealing with youth to not implement that type of thinking of like, you can either be this or you can either be that. And it's fine either way, but like, treating your body and being kind to yourself. Like we all innately have a body and we can move it. Like we should be okay and not have to suppress like, okay, I can, I'm not a dancer. That's just what it is. But last little note for me is um, my mom always told me when I was younger to have a backup because that's how a lot of people talk about dance is that it's it's going to fall through. So you have to do something else. So I think that's what pigeonholed me into being a multidisciplinary artist is because I always was or am a dancer plus, a dancer plus designer, dancer plus photographer or a videographer or X, Y, and Z, because you have to have a backup rather than like you can occupy all these spaces simultaneously, more like water and being amorphous and choosing to dance or not. So I just talked a lot. So yeah, check. <laughs> I just want to pull something out that you just said that like, I know I didn't put my name in the chat, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to jump in and then I'm going to call on you, Tree, I see you. Um, but I think it was also Audrey and Brie are pulling out something where I was like, I've been thinking about like what happens if I don't tell my body what I wanted to do, but allow my body to tell me what it needs. Um, and I like shift that whole thinking, like even if I'm at the gym, as opposed to being like, I'm going to do this, like for me to really be like, okay, what are the places in my body that are weak, that have been telling me that they need to, they want to be worked on. Um, and like also thinking about things like other activities, I mean, this makes me think of something Carlos was saying earlier, but if I'm thinking about other physical activities, all of them, not in relationship to my dance practice. I think for a long time, especially because I'm a person who grew up basically as dance being the main consistency since I was five. So like everything was supplemental to dance. Every, like exercise was only so that I could be stronger, uh, a stronger performer. Um, and if I like really separate those things and kind of like Brie, you're saying like, I am not, I am all of these things. They're not like, I don't know, I don't know how else to explain it, but um, as opposed to having them linked all of the time that I can have these practices live and coincide without um, them only being supplemental to dance. Um, so that's the thing that I've been, that was coming up for me and was coming up in a couple of things people were saying. Uh, I'm going to read these that came through the chat really quick and then it's all you, Tree. But Kathy said, um, I think if you identify as a dancer or an artist, then you are, no matter what your practice is or if you're not practicing. Um, and that P.S. midnight rehearsals and outdoor shows have been a regular part of her practice in the past. Um, uh, Christina has 
just pulling out my sense of my lifetime changing. And also being a movement artist doesn't mean I have to practice that, uh, have a practice that exists in a vacuum with or without the support of feedback from the community, et cetera. Um, and really quick from Carlos, the ideas of labels can, um, can place, uh, I'm sorry, I'm misreading this. The idea of labels can place undue expectation. I move, I create, I question, I offer. Um, yeah, all of these things. Uh, over to you, Tree. Like a news anchor. Over to you, Tree. Thank you. I forgot what I was even going to talk about, so I'm glad you interrupted there. Not interrupted, sorry, but like jumped in uh, when you did because I forgot why I even put my name in the chat. But I think I just wanted to give acknowledgement to Amy, your comment about um, giving value to artists as artists um, who do not practice with the same apparent vigor, which also um, we had similar language originally in our mission statement as Collective Sweat, um, which we have since changed um, a while back um, because we realized like rigor and vigor were just not words that needed to be placed like upon our community. Um, but anyway, it, I just felt like that resonated with me a lot um, coming from a very non-artistic family who never understood what I was going to do with my life and you know what are you going to do with dance like how are you going to make a living out of that so I always felt feeling like I had something to prove and there was this level that I needed to achieve but you know if being an artist is just what makes me happy like why can't that exist as well so that really resonated with me also going back to the question about taking away the shame and stigma and expectations and I believe this question was kind of directed as like within our community, but I also really feel this outside of our community. Um, I'm someone who chose to have a non-dance job. Um, like I work, I have this part-time gig that has nothing to do with dance and nothing to do with art. And I act, when people ask me like what else I do and why I don't work there full-time, my like other employees, you know, and I tell them, well, you know, like I do this and the, and you know, everything else is related to dance. And then I get, well, what are you doing here? as if the fact that I work there means that like, I haven't made it in my other field or like, I'm not good enough in my other fields. Like, why do I also work there? And like, why do I need to work and be there also? So it's like, the stigma is everywhere, I guess, is what I'm trying to say in different ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I was reading the comment and simmering with that moment. Um, yeah. Christina wrote here that uh, she's always had the fear of muscle memory fading um, to Audrey's comment about her turnout muscles and the experience of literally feeling dance leave my body. Um, and that the pandemic brought this out and forced her to confront that still a work in progress. Um, yeah. Oof, <laughs> this is like hitting me in the chest. I feel like, um, I don't know, it just feels, sometimes you guys are like articulating things that I may have in, like not even really fully acknowledged or known how to, to say. So that one just, I don't know, hit me in the chest. Um, wow. Maddie. I just, uh, like a bunch of things came up that I just felt the urge to say like me too toward. Um, so I'm going to present that list. Um, <laughs> uh, when Miriam said that like dance has been a thing, um, in her life since she was five and it is this like major consistency. I was like, me too. Been doing it for ages. And like um like the sort of conversation of like what would it look like if I wasn't dancing anymore it's like a really scary thing for me to think about because I'm like that's the only thing I've ever done my whole life all the time and which is a thing that's like like you know it's like my like I have a ton of friends who have jobs and things they love to do that like they 
only started doing a few years ago do you know? and it's like you know I love soups now and so it's like this funny thing of in my head I'm like I have to dance forever because I've always danced forever <laughs> and like that's not true but it feels like that's true um and the idea of like having a backup plan I was like every person I've ever told I wanted to be a dancer has always said that so I'm like same 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 backup plans um Audrey's like university program baggage I'm just here to say that I'm also working through that um and then like the comments Christina made of the like dance leaving the body and which is sort of related to this like university program baggage solidarity thing too that it's like yeah I like took Xandria's class yesterday as part of like the CSD birthday thing and we like what there was like one exercise in particular that I just was like having the hardest time with because I was like I could have done this so much better a year ago and so I was like having that conversation like in myself trying to like do a lateral and then like contract and I was like I know how to do this and so I was having a lot of like personal uh problems there and uh and then also I just want to like shout out Christina's other comment of this, like your practice doesn't have to be in a vacuum. And like during, like over the summer, uh, an old professor, I was like sort of talking about this thing of like, I don't know how to like be dancing in my apartment. It's too hard. I get bored. I have a really hard time having a solo practice. It's, it's so hard. And they were like, well, you just need to like do your ballet bar in the morning. And like, you just find yourself in your dance routine. And I was like, <laughs> I can't. so I just wanted to say that like and then just the way you articulated that I was like oh right like I don't like it's okay that I have a hard time doing like whatever floor bars by myself because like that's really hard like that's a hard thing to hold that so I just was like I appreciate that comment Christina I was like right right it doesn't have to so anyway that was my list of um me too's I put myself in the chat because some of the things you're saying, Maddie, I was like, boom, 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 boom. But before I talk, I, I want to make space if other folks wanted to put their names in the chat um, based on that as well to go before me. OK, I'm going to jump in. Um, I Something I've been thinking about sort of in the response to this place that we've sort of landed in is like, has dance as we've known it or has a certain type of dance practice as we've known it left our bodies or like left our or changed in our muscle memory or how our muscles remember and like feeling that experience come up perhaps like in a virtual dance class when you're in your bedroom and oh I can't actually do the full combination and oh is it is it still there I remember it but it's different um and I I want to like offer a perspective that I think has been really generative for me is to start shifting how I'm thinking about dance practice as sort of just another way that I can be in my human practice. And so decentering dance as career, but more like centering Audrey um, and dance is just one way I center myself in my own life. Um, and so I'm thinking of like what, what my body remembers and like being in the technique of my physical body and trusting my own body. So whether that's a day where I'm like working at this farm job and I'm just like planting onions for like two hours, that is my movement practice that day. Or maybe I am in my room and, or like maybe I have a, a strange burst of like energy slash like general pandemic anxiety at like 11 a.m. and I go run around and like do a bunch of like jumping at the like park by my house. Um, so starting a transition, yeah, like being with earth, being with my body as like the practice. And of course I have been doing dance for most of my life. And so I also call it dance, but kind of decentering like the technique of it. Um, and then I kind in, in that thought, I kind of want to like take us back to a question that we offered is like, what then could we start to use to replace the expectations around like, oh, if you've just stopped dancing in the way you have been, or oh, if your practice has stopped because it's a pandemic and you're not teaching 
the class in the same way or et cetera, what are actually, what are these things that we're learning? Like I'm saying, okay, I'm learning to center myself and embodied practice is one of those ways. Um, what else, what are some things we're like now building for ourselves? And this isn't, this is not a question that we put in the, the like plan, but I wanna ask it of like, okay, there's, we're getting rid of these expectations, working through shame, working through stigma. Well, what are we replacing or maybe not replacing, but what different neurons are we building? Um, what are we reconstructing? So maybe I'll write, it's like what instead are we learning? I think that's my thought. And maybe I'll read what's in the chat. Carlos writes, yes, tilling the soil is a practice. Earth is practice, yes. Dance, this is one way that I, this is just what I said. How our identity is deconstructing and being reinvented. Yes. Cool, so I'll open it up for folks to kind of jump in from there, if that's clear. Green. I think what's coming up for me is um, re the need for slowness or stillness um, in any part of your body. Um, I was always kind of a slow mover before, but it's like, even now I'm like, well, this is actually what motion is. <laughs> um, but there's also like that trails the line of like compassion for yourself and for others is um, I think what I've been encountering the most at least in the way that I'm understanding your question, Audrey. And then I think Monica. Um, yes, hi. So um, I just was writing down some thoughts about, about that. Um, and I don't remember what some of them mean, so I'm just gonna read them off and then maybe it'll come to me. <laughs> but I was writing no movement, not moving until I have to, um, and a collage artist. Like how I, I, I taught class um, yesterday morning and I sat the entire time I was teaching and I was more facilitating other people's movement. And that's what's been really interesting to me right now is just being an observer. And if I create anything from that, it's, I feel more like, you know, when you like would cut things out of a magazine and like make a collage, like that's how I feel when I make art now. And I, I don't feel the pressure to move myself. I find much more joy in the collaboration process, but how I'm changing my, my brain is what needs to be seen and what is performance? Like, do we need an audience Is like, like Audrey said earlier on, like, getting out of that, the eye of the audience. Um, and so anytime I'm, I'm dancing, is that a performance? Like for who, who's watching? Like could these like non-human entities of the earth be my, be my audience? Um, yeah. I think Carlos is next on our list. Thanks, Monica, yes. Uh, kind of chiming in on um, what Brett Bree was saying, I'm gonna put some of the notes that I had that everybody was offering. Um, one of the things I think for myself as an artist and, you know, again, you know, drawing on being able to work with some other individuals is you know, again, navigating through space inside of academia, I, I, <laughs> I'm kind of always the outsider coming in because I, you know, this imposter syndrome because I'm actually everything against what academia is. But we know sometimes that's the, um, that's that, you know, uh, my, my father used to say, you work for the man while you're working on your plan, right? And so, <laughs> you know, it's like, how do we take that generated income and then place it into our passion projects or pay, um, place it into our, you know, our artistry. 
And one of the things that, you know, um, and what I offered in the chat is, you know, reframing, because in academia, they separated theater, um, music, and all of those are valid, you know, whatever your interests are, and whatever your discoveries is, you know, we're so fixated on what is the body and what is it doing and how are we training it? You know, again, you know, I learned discipline in martial arts even before I understood, you know, so it, to me, they were just like, oh, well, discipline in martial arts is discipline in ballet. It's all lines and forms. You just renaming it and with names that maybe already had names to it. Um, so offering that, you know, investigations and in how others um, were devising movement inside of theater spaces, because I also teach movement for actors. Um, you know, iterations of small movements that gets into, again, to, you know, pedestrian movements and how do you tease that into a larger way. When I was working with Ralph, um, he would have this idea of having, um, you know, problem solving via mu movement, right? So, you know, coming into the studio, um, I think what, um, I believe uh, what Monica was saying was that offering space for others to have creativity and then actually being in the place of observation that can actually tease up other things, other questions, and other ways that you can approach your creative practice. Because, you know, the way that I particularly work is that, you know, I think about the questions and how do we solve those questions via movement invention, right? So it's kind of approaching it from a different perspective, I would say, than, okay, I have to do this body, it has to create this line, it has to create this visceral feeling and, and kinesthesia with the audience, because that can all still be created just by investigation, right? And um, and then, you know, documentation and, and you revise those thoughts, um, being able to like look at it and see how it lands on your body. Because I've always looked at video as, you know, my mirror that I could go back to and refer, right? So, you know, as dancers, we stand in the mirror and we're looking at this line, you know, one thing, the video don't lie, right? <laughs> so you can, you can go back and see if it achieved the feeling and the impact that you wanted and letting go of less that it has to look a certain way or be a certain thing, you know, you get to see in real time when you go to playback, like, oh, is that hitting? Okay, that's hitting on video, then I know it's gonna hit live. So, okay, let's keep going. Let's let's keep something. Let's, you know, shell something or move. But yeah, I just wanted to offer that up. Um, yeah, I wanna bounce off that. Um, real quick because it uh, a choreographer um audrey and i both worked with was jennifer harge which probably all of you know and one of the things that really kind of blew me away about one of her rehearsals is that we were preparing for a show had learned all the material and like the week of the show or something she was like what if you just like didn't do any of it or did like you choose which portions of this dance you're gonna do. And that was the first time that I ever, ever heard anybody say something like that to me. And so she was like, just do what feels, what actually feels like is what you need to say uh, in the moment you need to say it as opposed to doing movement that like you may or may not even be mentally there, your body is just doing a thing. And if that moment, like, but if that movement um, will help you in the work, then do that. Like do the choreography if you think that that's gonna root you to the work um, too. So anyway, so she, she like had this moment where she just kind of like flipped it on its head and was like, do actually what feels good. Um, and that shifted, just like honestly for me, that shifted the way that I create. And I think about that all the time of like what, if you have like, what am I actually trying to say? And like you're saying, is it actually coming across when I look back at it? Um, did I feel it coming across as I was doing it? Um, and maybe I don't know that I have an exact point, but I just wanted to share that that was an experience that really kind of like uh, helped me evolve in how I was thinking about movement and movement creation and what needed to happen when so. Yeah, I'll, I'll read um, what Christina put in the chat. 
Dancers are so trained to be so selfless. Maybe what we are building instead is space for more agency for dancers being a bit selfish sometimes. What Miriam is saying about doing what feels like it needs to be said, yes. Bodies holding memory instincts to guide our performance practice. Yes. Yeah. Want to like leave a pause, a beat, if anyone else wants to add their name or add in the chat. And then I wonder if there's like a next, a next transition again. Um, cool. I'm gonna keep going then. So I feel like we're at this place in what's coming up around like um, building dance or movement or using our movement practice or whatever our artistic practice is, however we are defining it um, and using that to be like, what does my body need? What does my life need right now? And I think I want to shift into maybe sort of our last framing question of, well, how are we then synchronizing with each other? Seems like this moment in time is act asking us to adapt and transform a lot of our expectations wherever we are on the spectrum of like relationship to dance, relationship to arts, visual movement, et cetera. Um, and so I'm curious about having a conversation around how, how are we syncing up? How are we in communication and communion with each other in our adaptations? And how are we supporting each other? How are we not leaving people behind as we're like trying to work through perhaps like the academia or the institutionalized or the elitist beliefs that we're shedding that like have informed expectations. Um, and then in synchronicity, I wanna offer a quote to kind of frame thinking about that word. Um, and I'm paraphrasing and taking this quote from this zine or that's about abolishing time. And it's by this writer, Estelle Ellison, who's a black trans non-binary writer, I think based in the Bay Area. And she is writing this in regards to getting rid of ordered time, which is another form of discussion. But what I'll, what I'll share in the space, um, and when I use the word synchronizing, this is kind of what I mean. Um, she writes, we have always had the ability to synchronize with each other. We have always known rhythmic cycles of harmony and change. We have always sought connection with each other. We have the ability to seek each other out and change the world around us. We have the ability to create and that is precisely why we must abolish time. Um, and I'm gonna keep reading because it's good. Under capitalism, time is used as a tool to keep us from making a better future together, to keep us within hierarchical system. Time ensures that our livelihoods are tied to our obedience and our willingness to make someone else wealthy in the future. And then I'm gonna skip forward. To build accessibility for everyone where no one is ever disposed of, we need sustainable networks of care. So I wanna leave that in the space um, just to think about how we synchronize. And we thought that maybe breakout rooms could be a nice chance to get in smaller conversations, but I think this, this group is fine and I'm I don't think we should do bigger rooms, but I want to ask that to Miriam too. <laughs> I mean, I feel good with, I feel good where we are. I don't yeah. know if people wanted to have a more, more um, intimate group. conversation. But if we're all maybe, good. Yeah, maybe like wave or do a gesture if you're really dying to, to do a smaller conversation. Otherwise, we'll stay in this group. Also, if you find that you want to like message someone directly, I don't, I think everyone has that capability. So like, if you need to have a smaller conversation, please do so in the chat, like in the way that you need. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll like open with one version of those questions. Um, how are we listening to each other? How are we supporting each other? As sort of the first offering to think about. 
How are we listening, feeling each other's adaptations? How are we supporting each other? I think one thing could be conversations like the one you're having. I think I can sort of jump in. Um, the first thing that's coming up for me in that question is like, I had a counter thought of like, well, how am I even listening to myself? Like, how am I even supporting myself as I evolve through this movement and through life in general? But like, how am I making sure to really listen when my body sends signals to me so that I'm even capable of sharing it with y'all? Um, and that feels like a, at least for me, that feels like a, a load, <laughs> like a, like a big uh, shift. Um, but I do think that it looks like, I mean, it can look a lot of ways, but I do think that it looks kind of like was how Brie was saying that we need to have more of these conversations. We need to have more spaces um, that allow for us to be as truthful about our experience as possible and share whatever we need to share. Um, but we have to do that with ourselves first. That's what's coming up for me. I think Bree, her name is, yeah. Yeah, I'll pop in. Um, first thing that came up for me is the book that I'm still working on reading, but it still is on the list, is the Emergent Strategy book that we all started together by Adrienne Marie Brown and how it kind of sounded similar to her idea of fractals and how you do anything is how you do everything in these like encapsulating circles and encompassing spaces down to like the cellular level and like what Miriam was saying, how you care for yourself and what you do at the micro level is how it can be translated to everything else at a larger scale. So how we have even these small conversations or interacting with family or like with tree when you're in your other spaces in your job, just how we talk about um, anything or how we behave is translated um, into whether it is in our dance practice or outside of our dance practice. Um, so I think I guess what I'm getting into is like what Miriam was saying and just uh, echoing that is like the internal practice and how you self-reflect and what you want to see from other people or how you want to shape um, is just as important as just mm, how we do for ourselves is what we want to do for others. I don't know. I guess that's where I'm at. I'll also pop back in here to say that like there have been times where I was surprised how many people were on the same page as me or like questioning exactly the same thing. So I do feel like there's like maybe just a, the word is escaping me, but to some extent, I do think that we're synchronizing, whether we are like actively trying to synchronize with folks or not. I think that it there's, uh, with, synergy is that the right word I don't know that there's a, a synergy that is um, inherent and to some extent um it's just there like I've I've had conversations with folks on different sides of the country and like they're like I don't know oftentimes they're questioning and thinking about and wondering and this a lot of the same things and we find each other somehow and are able to continue that conversation and feed each other. Um, so I think that to some extent it, it's brought to you, the people you're supposed to synchronize with, the conversations you're supposed to have. Um, yeah, that's all I got. I just threw a little yes in the chat because I was like, yes. I feel it. Okay, Monica, go for it. I just think that we, Miriam, like we are 
together and like with these other like-minded individuals because we have a lot of similar backgrounds like we've said this whole talk is like a lot of us grew up in a studio world and we went to similar universities together so in my brain this lack of support that we're looking for or this and that that could be like synchronizing in our similar experiences but this lack of support that we're looking for and this shift of thought starts so extremely young and I know some of us are dance teachers but some of us are not so how do we shift this for the next generation of performers that it's not just going to be this like cyclical um like repetition of having this like trauma response from growing up in a dance world that's just not doing things for us and either we're leaving this dance world behind or we're just having forums like this so if we're not all going to be dance teachers and just reimagining and reinventing what dance education is and how it's run like how do we yeah just an open question for us to think about Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, like, reflection, Monica. Um, I feel like something Brie was sharing on an uplifting Adrian Marie Brown's work in the space of like, and I think Miriam was saying this too, about like listening to ourselves. I think like how we're showing up in our individual spaces in our lives is one place that we can even shape how dance is, is considered in like a social and bigger cultural level. And actually, I don't think I actually wanna say cultural, that's not the word I wanna use, but just how we're engaging with dance affects like our direct community's perception of it. So that's my offering to that question, but I wanna know what everybody thinks too, cause I'm asking that too. I'm like, if I'm not, if I'm not teaching a space, if I'm not leading a space, like I'm still, I'm feeling the change in my own body. And like, I'm talking about it with my friends but what is there another is there another level is that the work i don't know so just kind of reflecting it back again to the group let's see oh i i can also read what's been in the chat this during this um this combo feels like a simultaneous synchronous looking in which feels constructive and yes hearts wow uh Recovering and reprogramming from studio competition dance is really a thing. It's a good question. So many layers. Maddie, go for it. Maddie. I was like, I had written my name in and I had my fingers on the enter button and I was like deciding if I was going to hit it and then I did it by accident. So um, I guess I'll talk. I, uh, yeah, I'm like it. So like the people that I talk to every day are like the person that I live with, who's like not a dance person at all, um, but he's great. And and my friend and collaborator, Scott, like, you, so it's like, and then I see like CSD, we have a weekly meeting. So like we're chatting, but it's like the amount of people that I like have an opportunity to like have a conversation with is really limited. And so, but, but like this like particular time spent in this forum is it's like reminds me of the things that would just like happen while I was like out at shows or classes and things. And so I'm like, where is the, I don't know, or like where for me is the place to revisit these kinds of things and to like have these like synchronous like brain moments at, that's like, Cause like, honestly, the way that I like see all of your faces, like most often is like on social media. And like, that is not a way for me to actually know like that, or I have a hard time understand, like it, it's hard for me to, social media is hard. <laughs> like, like I have a hard time really knowing, like it's hard. Um, so yeah. I don't know. I'm like, cause I'm like, I'd like to keep talking about this now, but I like don't know where to do that. So that's a question that I'm thinking about.
Um, I'll pass it to Tree and then I'll read Monica wrote, I know we weren't face to face, but love seeing the comments in the feed from the virtual performance last night. I felt that too. And Christina asks, where does the synchronizing happen? What spaces? Like where in space maybe, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I I guess I was just still sitting on a lot of what Monica said and um, changing things for the next generation. And I mean, I don't have an answer to that at all, but something that I started doing when the stay at home order started and suddenly I was teaching my university students on Zoom is just asking them how they're feeling um, because I realized no one ever asked me that and why it took me until the pandemic to finally ask my students how they were feeling is an, something else to think about, I guess. But I just remember when I was their ages and in their places, no one ever, like I was just told what to do. I was told what dance to learn and I was told how to do it, but no one ever asked me how I felt about it. So I guess that's just like a starting point, at least of where I've been at is just asking them like, how are you? Um, how do you feel in what we're doing? Um, do you find validity in it? I'm like, there's history in it, so we're still going to learn it. But how are you feeling in it? And like, you know, that that's, that's valid and that's fair too. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to read what's popping up in the chat here. Um, so Maddie said, and it could be outer space, connective air space, all kinds of space, inner space, um, but also talking and listening spaces too. And then Audrey uh, says yes to all the spaces and yes, asking, sorry, and yes, asking each other, how are you? Um, Oh, wow. Blowing me up. Okay, Monica. <laughs> yeah, um, to Kathy, I think it validates to others to look at dance as a sport, which is something that holds value in our society. Um, and from Christina, also hard to think in post-COVID terms, isolation is so intimidating and aggressively present right now. True. And from Carlos, often in these spaces, the labor is placed upon people of color to bring attention to dismantling Eurocentered thought to dance practice. In my opinion, we should prepare the next generation to apply media tech to their practice. It will be a tool and it creates a transferable skill set. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oof. So this is a, a really dense conversation and I hate to like try to hone it back in. Um, but we will absolutely be having more forums in the future where we can gather together and share space, um, maybe continue this conversation and have other ones. Uh, I'm, I'm also just like still simmering with Monica's <laughs> question. Um, but uh, but yeah, we will come back to these thoughts and questions where we'll be able to at least share space together. Before we close, we should um, take a moment to physically check out. Um, so I ask that we just take a moment and you can soften your gaze, begin to close your eyes. And starting from the top of your head, just scanning down how your body feels now. Scanning past your neck, down past your shoulders. How are they sitting? How are they holding you, your chest? your stomach, down past your hips, down your thighs, your calves, your ankles, down 
down through your toes. Coming back to that connection that you had at the beginning, thinking about how you're connected to the earth. Noticing which part of your body is connected to the earth or closest to it. And then let's just take three breaths in together. So breathing in. And out. Taking another breath in. And out. And last one, the biggest one of the day so far, breathing in. And letting it go. Coming back to your soft gaze or slowly blinking your eyes open to return to your virtual self on the screen. Um, so yeah, uh, we will be sending out, Audrey, I know you said you were going to do this, but I felt like you moderated the other portions. Um, we'll be sending out surveys um, over the next week of if this whole weekend. Um, and you'll be able to give us feedback on what worked for you this weekend, where what felt good. And, um, and to remember that the birthday party performance link that was yesterday at 7 p.m. will be up for a week. So in your registration, you'll have, uh, you have access to the, the link so you can watch it anytime this week or as much as you want in case you missed it yesterday. Um, and then again, this is a fundraiser. So uh, we are taking donations through Give Butter that will be placed in the chat momentarily. There it is, there she blows. And um, yeah, so just if you're feeling led to offer us something so that we can continue to have programs like this, hold classes um, and share space, do what you feel led to do. Um, and then otherwise it was, this space felt really good and, and helpful and constructive. And uh, I just am really looking forward to the next one. Honestly, in this moment, I like am ready. I could continue having conversation, but I realized we are at the time. So I thank you all for coming and I hope to see you on the internet somewhere soon in class and virtual class and virtual spaces. Thank y'all. Yes, thanks to all of you. So good to be in this discussion space with each of you. Appreciate your presence and take care. Take care as you transition into your next piece of the day. Good to talk with everybody. And yes, take care. Yes, thank you. Thank y'all for coming. Yeah, truly appreciate. And I just wanna do a quick shout out to Miriam and Audrey for curating this portion and putting this all together and being the spectacular people you are. So yeah, hearts to y'all. All back to each of you. <laughs>